Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. Good to have you with us. Good to have you all with us tonight also. It's a little cold out there, but praise the Lord. You wouldn't believe it, but in Russia, even in the cold weather like this, they have baptisms outside. That's how desperate they are to be right with God and wanting to obey God's word. It's amazing. Praise God. Anyone have a testimony? No testimony? Temptimony? Okay. Any testimony? No? Huh? You thinking? Praise the Lord. Okay, what's your prayer request? Well, you have to come up because... They won't be able to hear you. Um, this past summer, a lady at work, her name is Janice, her daughter had a tumor in her mouth, and we had prayed for her. And when I seen her, when I came back to work, her, the result and everything came out better than they had thought. They thought that they were going to have, she was going to have half of a jaw. And it was just a really devastating thing. But when I seen her, she had a smile on her face. And she told me that you could hardly even tell that anything had happened. And I was praising God. And, and all she has is a little scar. So she's doing well. So praise God for that. And But t today, um, her sister is dying. Um, she had been a drug addict in the past. But now her organs are affected by this. And she's on her deathbed right now, so if we could just pray for her um, that God could turn this around. Um, for what the devil meant for evil, God could turn for good. And that I can um, continue to pray with her and uh, maybe even go see her. So you, can I pray right now? Sure. <clears throat> Father, Lord, you know where this lady is, Lord. Lord, you know Debbie. And you know her past, God. But Lord, right here today, Father, I pray that your will would be done in her life. Lord, I pray that you would heal her. Lord, that if it is her time, Father, I pray that I would be able to speak to her or someone would share the gospel with her, Lord. I pray that, Lord, she would be saved, Lord. And Lord Jesus, I just pray for your mercy upon her life, God. You know what's best, Father, and I know, God, that if it's your will, Lord, Lord, you will make a way for her to be saved, and I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you getting excited about Jesus? You know, uh, President Trump has officially announced that Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel and that they're moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. And I believe that's just the beginning. Um, you're seeing a lot of things on the news, a lot of uprisings they're saying, but I talked uh, through text with Patty, who's in Israel, and uh, she said, don't believe the hype of the media. They're just bringing the cameras into the places where there's a few protesters making it look bigger than what it is. And uh, so... Um, but we know that Jesus is coming back soon. We know we're living in the last days, yes. No. Yes, when they announced that, uh, my wife was say saying that, um, when they made the announcement down at the Wailing Wall, this sounds very tinny tonight. You know, I don't know what's going on or why it sounds so tinny through the, through the system. Even the music sounded tinny tonight. Um, but, um, huh? They were celebrating at the Wailing Wall when Trump made the announcement. And uh, so... 
we all have a philosophy, we all have our ideology, we all have our worldview of believing that Jesus Christ is coming back again. And um, before, if you can just give me a little more on this mic. See, this mic is very, sounds very, very tinny, brother. I don't know what the problem is with the sound system tonight. But um, that's better. But uh, we need to take a day of fasting. One day of fasting. And I believe that that's going to break open the boundaries and uh, tear, out, tear open a, a way that God can really move. Amen? Praise the Lord. And if we believe that Jesus Christ is coming back, then I just want to share a message with you tonight that I believe that the kingdom of God wants to use you. And the title of my message, message is For Such a Time as This. We're in the last days, we're, we know that, and we know that God is about to do something on a major, major scale. Now, wherever God moves, the devil always has counterfeits, we understand that. But I want you to know that it's not in the number or the size of what's going to happen, but it's in the quality of what God's doing. God is beginning to move people closer to him. And so the quality of the Christian is going to be greatly enhanced. I believe that there's going to be such an overpowering presence of God in each individual life that it's going to make all the difference in the world as evil gets worse and worse. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Esther. To the book of Esther. Hallelujah. Say, Esther, where is Esther? It's in your Bible. Praise the Lord. Esther is right after Nehemiah. It's a, it's a story about Asurses, the king, and Mordecai and Haman. And most of you know the story. If you don't, please read the book of Esther. And how even back here at this time, before even Hitler came on the scene to try to destroy the Jews, there has always been a plot. There has always been a, uh, an attempt to wipe out the Jewish people. And you have to ask the question, why is there such an anti-Semitic feeling toward the Jews? What have they done? And I don't believe it's anything that they have done personally. I, I don't believe that it's because they're Jewish. But I believe that there is a demonic plot to destroy the Jewish people because of what this book says. This book says that God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not to Ishmael. And so I know that disappoints a lot of Muslims, but you know what? You've got to take that up with God, not with uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they did not institute the promise. God instituted the promise. And so, because of that, there's been a tremendous hatred toward the Jewish people. And even in the time of Esther, there was a man by the name of Haman that had such envy and jealousy toward Mordecai. And Mordecai, I believe, was a God-fearing man. And in this story, we see that 
Haman was a little bit jealous. And to make a long story short, he wanted to see the Israelites who were beginning to build themselves up. And he wanted to see them destroyed. And so let's look for a moment in chapter 3. And we're just going to kind of read from chapter 3, starting with verse 1. And after these things did King Asurses promote Haman, the son of Haminathath, the, he the Haggai, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princesses that were with him. Now we're talking about a local government here. We're talking about an established government. And I want to say this, that the established governments may think that they can overrule God's government. But that may be just temporary. But can I tell you, when God wants to step into a government... He can change things. And you can see, even from our very own elections, that everyone thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win, hands down. They already had the party. They already had the fireworks. They had everything all set. And here was a non-politician, someone that didn't have any political experience, and he came out of nowhere, and he won the election. If you saw the newscasters that night, on election night, if you saw the newscasters, they were all happy, they were all, you know, gung-ho, Hillary was in the lead, but then something in the midst of that happened. I believe it was God. And God somehow, some way began to turn that election around. And the end result was we have President Trump. Now, he's not the best candidate in the whole world. <laughs> I'm sure you know that. He says things and does things that make your eyebrows go up a little bit. But I believe that God has appointed him for such a time as this. Our country was going down the tubes. Our country was going into the socialistic realm. Our country was going down to a place, and it had nothing to do with the, the color of our president. Please understand that. But our country was moving towards socialism. Our country was beginning to move into the one world global uh, uh, reign and ruling of, of a sovereignty that was handed over to the new world order, we would have been in big trouble. Because they want to set up a democracy throughout the whole world where everyone in the world has a say. And I'm telling you right now, that will not be, that should not be in America the Japanese, the Chinese, the Indonesians, the Philippines, the Asians, the, Russian, <clears throat> the Russians, the Germans should not have a say on what goes on in America. They want to do away with our Constitution. But anyway, those are the things that were happening. So God intervened and set a man. Hallelujah. How many know that God has a person? God has a person in the time of trouble. I'm reading that book, The Paradigm, by Jonathan Kahn. If you can get that book, or if you'd like that book, see me after. I'll put your name down. I'll order one for you. You need to read that book. It is amazing <clears throat> of how, in the paradigm, he uses a correlation between the Clintons and Jezebel and Ahab. And you'll be amazed. I'm not going to tell you the rest of it, but you'll be amazed. My point is this. Is that even during the time of Ahab and Jezebel, even during those times of great stress in the nation, God had a prophet, Elijah. 
Hallelujah. He had a man that would stand up to the reign and the rule and the demonic leadership of his day. Where the influence was and the false gods they worshipped and the killing of their babies to the god Moloch. We sacrifice our babies every single day in abortion. But whenever those things happen in a nation, God always has an Elijah. He always raises up somebody for such a time as this. And I want you to understand, please, it's not some of these lying prophets that are out there on television. If you see them today, most of them are already gone off television. They're the ones that prophesy and you call the 900 number. It's like uh, fortune tellers. But I'm talking about a real man of God, one who's going to stand and preach the truth no matter what. Someone who's going to stand even in the perils of his own reputation and sing out and cry out what the nation is doing wrong, what the people were doing wrong. And so Haman here, he comes and he, he's lifted up to a position of leadership. You know that men always judge according to appearance. They judge according to the outward. They look to the outward and they try to choose the best one that has the, the, the PhD and the masters and so forth and so on. Then the schools that they go to, they're always picking out the best ones. But can I tell you, in God's kingdom, it always isn't, it, it isn't that way. God chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. He chooses the unlovely the unaccepted things. <clears throat> and that's a pattern that God has had all the way through the Old Testament. Remember the sons of Jesse, when they were looking for a king, and uh, Samuel said, bring your sons, uh, Jesse, to, uh, so we can look at them. And the first one was, of course, on the outward appearance, looked like a warrior, and he was all set. And they said, surely this is the one. And Samuel said, no. The Lord has not chosen him. You understand God has not chosen him. Man will choose. Man will choose the one that is the most charismatic. Man will choose the one who's gifted. Man will choose the one from the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. And so he goes through all the sons of Jesse and then he finally says, do you have any other sons? And he says, yes. He says, I have one other son. But he's a little ruddy, little critter. You know, he's out in the field tending the sheep. You know, he said, bring him. He was the insignificant one. He was the one that wasn't really out in the uh, accolades of, of society. They, they didn't see him as a champion. And he comes from the field, and he's just a young boy. Now hear me now. And so he comes, and he stands before Samuel. And Samuel looks at him, and something in Samuel began to stir. And it was the Holy Spirit beginning to stir Samuel. And Samuel said, ah, <laughs> this is the one to be the king. The one that was the least qualified, the one that would be least chosen. How have you ever felt like that when you was on a when you were being picked for a team and they picked you last? And then they flipped for you to see who would get you. 
And I tell you, God sees from the inside. And he has a call for this generation, for such a time as this. He has a divine call upon not only the young, but the old. Not only the men, but the women in their proper place. Let me clarify that. How many know we all have an order and a place? Amen. So Haman here jockeys himself and positions himself by what we would call being a brown nose today, sucking up to the leadership, you know, trying to make himself something he is not. And it works, and he gets to a place of leadership. And in verse 2 it says, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and revered Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not. Nor did him reverence. Man's appointment is not God's chosen. Just because a man chooses doesn't mean it's God's appointment. And so Mordecai, being the man of God he was, he says, I'm not bowing to this man. And I'm not paying reverence, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to authority, but I'm letting you know right now that I'm not bowing. And so the story goes on, and you see that um, Haman saw that Mordecai, verse 5, bowed not, nor did him reverence, and then was Haman full of wrath. I'll tell you, it's something when you won't comply to man's ways of doing things. Or you won't comply to the worldly, sensual conditions that much of the church has fallen into today. A.W. Towser said this, he says, and this was way back in this, 60s, I believe it was. He says, I fear that there is a new generation rising up where they are claiming Christianity without change. How true that is today. But we cannot bow to the signs of the times that we're living in. And um, let me also, I, I didn't get a chance to announce this before the service I had forgotten, but I want to announce this, that uh, our sister Earlene went home to be with Jesus uh, the, other, the other night. And so uh, keep the family in prayer. and they'll, I'll be in, they'll be in touch with me letting me know what's going on. But um, I got to see her in the hospital, but she was unconscious, and she was hooked up to all kinds of tubes, and and so I got to pray for her. But um, just keep the family in prayer. Haman was full of wrath. And he also plotted to try to get Mordecai alone, and he was going to kill him. Well, to make a long story short, He goes to the king, and the king, he tells the king, you know, he says, you, the Jews are rising up, and you know, they're going to, they're not a good people, so you might as well do away with them. So finally the king makes a decree, Xerxes makes a decree to uh, wipe out all of the Jews. So Mordecai, he appeals to Esther. 
the queen. And Esther was Jewish. And so she proclaims to the people that they must have a fast, a three-day fast. So they go on a three-day fast. And I want to say something. I believe that if you, if you and I will fast, God can change circumstances and situations of a nation. It was the decree of the king that all the Jews were to be eliminated. So Mordecai goes to Esther, tells her what's going on. She proclaims a fast. And so somehow, Haman gets with Esther and shows her a decree from the king. And that's when she, she says, we're going to have a fast. You know, she tells the people, we're going to fast. And we're going to, I'm going to go before the king. Now understand that you couldn't just go before the king anytime you wanted to, even if you were the wife of the king. You couldn't just walk in the door and come in and say, hey, I want to talk to you. <laughs> Didn't work that way. You had to be called. And so M Mordecai said to Esther, but you can't just go into the king. If you do, you could perish. And she says, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going. And so she went, and she got dressed, and she stood at the door of the palace. And the king saw her from afar off. And well, you know the story. And look at verse uh, 12. Let's go to verse 12. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now you say, well, pastor, you're talking about queens and kings and people in authority in places. But I want you to know, hallelujah, that God has a plan for your life. God has preordained before the foundation of the world and has decreed you to be born at the time you were born. Nothing's done by accident. You know, they say, oops, <laughs> we didn't intend to have you, but you, you were an accident. No, you weren't an accident. God had already predetermined in his, in his foreknowledge that you would be born at such a time as this. You were born when you were born because God ordained it to be so. And not only has God ordained it to be so, but God has called you for such a time as this. It's not just the pastor. It's not just the uh, singers. It's not just the... Uh, uh, deacons and elders, God has called you for such a time as this. I say that into the camera to you that are watching by Facebook. God has called you for such a time as this. To reach your world, wherever you are, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has called you and chosen you and you may be the least qualified in your mind. But can I tell you, all you need is a voice. All you need is a mouth. All you need to do is have ears and hear what the Spirit of God says. And whatever He says, you open your mouth and you begin to speak. Hallelujah. You begin to speak what God wants you to speak. And leave the results where they lay. But God has called you. He didn't call you just to come to church. 
He didn't call you just to tune into Facebook. He called you with a purpose and a plan for your life. And how you get that plan and how you understand what God has for you is you get into a good Bible-believing church under a good anointed pastor and you listen to the Word and you learn the Word of God and you learn doctrine and you learn the teaching and then you receive all of that and then you equip yourself to be able to go out and fulfill the very thing that God has called you to do and be. Every single one within the sound of my voice, you have been called for such a time as this. The world needs you. The world needs your input. Because how shall they hear unless a preacher is sent? You say, but I'm not a preacher. Well, if you share your testimony, you're a preacher. If you share how God saved you, you're a preacher. You're telling the good news of how God can change a life. How God can change your life around from being meaningless and sinful and lustful and all of the things that you did in the world and change your life around so that you can serve Him and be used by Him. And so what happens here is Finally, Esther says, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going. She goes before the king. You know the story. And then she begins to expound to the king the plot that Haman had. You ever have someone talk about you, ever, uh, uh, falsely accuse you of something? And when the king got word of it, and, you know, the very thing is this, is that, you know, our enemy, Satan, he has plots and plans and all this kind of stuff. You know, that he's going to destroy you. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill your kids. He's going to take your kids through drugs and alcohol and, you know, all that kind of stuff. He has all his plans, and he, he tries to do all that. And he comes up with all of his schemes. The same way here is Haman, his wife is the one that said to him, why don't you make a hangman's noose and go hang Mordecai? And it says they thought that was a great idea, so he did. He had it made. And he was going to hang Mordecai. Understand now, he was a prince. He was a person of authority. I want to say that to you. I see people on, uh, sometimes on, on the uh, YouTube, preachers that are preaching on the corner and police coming and arresting them and taking them to jail. And they said, we will gladly go to jail, but you are wrong. We have a right to be out here. We have a right to preach. And, and they would go to jail, go before the judge, and the judge says, they have every right to do what they're doing. And they have to be loose. And they went right back on the corner and preached again. You know, in the Bible, that's what they did. They preached, and if they got beaten... When after they recuperated, they went right back to the city. They got beaten that and went right back preaching. Now, you and I would have said, no, that's stupid. We, we need to find another place. But I was talking with somebody today, and I said, you know something? When you fall in love with Jesus, and you love Jesus, you want to do everything you can to please Jesus. And that's the problem. When we lose our first love, like the Ephesian church in Revelation, they lost their first love. They had riches. They had everything. They had everything they needed. But they lost their first love. The first love was to tell people about him. And so here Mordecai is here waiting, and Haman's plotting all this time to kill him, to hang him. So... Esther gets word of this. And Esther tells the king. And the king also tells her, he says, Esther, you just ask me anything, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. 
what happens next is when she tells him the plot, the king says, go get Haman. And Haman, of course, thought he was going to be honored, you know, as the king had promised, he was going to be honored before all, and he was going to get to ride on the king's horse, you know, and, and be recognized for, for being uh, promoted in the king's uh, staff or army or whatever you want to call it. And as soon as he comes in, the king says, take that noose that Haman had for Mordecai and hang Haman. Let me tell you something. In the end, the enemy's going to get it. And you don't have to worry about what could happen to me because God can turn it around just like he did for Mordecai. Hallelujah. But you have to be a Mordecai in order to have the miracle. You want to see God's miracle in your life? You want to see God move in your life? You want to see God rescue you out of things? Then you've got to be a risk taker. If you just keep your mouth shut, and you want to see things happen, you want to see this nation turn back to God, it's not going to happen. It's going to take the Elijahs of the time of the Ahabs and the Jezebels. It's going to take the Elijahs and the Elishas to stand up and begin to preach the truth and speak the truth of God's word. Can I get a good amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't go by what you see on the outward appearance. Don't go by the, by the threats that society will tell you. If you don't do this, then you're going to get arrested. If you don't do this, then this is going to happen. And they try to instill fear in you. But why are they trying to instill fear when you're only bringing something good The Bible says there'll come a time when, they, when, when they're going to call good evil and evil good. That time is here. I heard one of the dumbest things I ever heard an actress say. She said, Islam is a peaceful religion. Christianity is a peaceful religion. See, their Bible, or their Quran tells them to kill the infidels, your enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to them who despitefully use you. So our gospel is a gospel of love. There is a gospel of hate. If you don't convert to, to Islam, you are to, they are to call and Annihilate you, kill you. But God has called us for such a time as this. The Muslims need Jesus. Amen. They're being radicalized. These people are being brainwashed. thinking America is evil. And some of the things America does is evil. But some of the things that they do in their nation are evil too. Like stoning a woman to death because her face was shown. But God is calling us. And I want to I sound the alarm tonight. God is calling us for such a time as this. To speak up, not to be quiet, not to be silent. He's calling us to be an example to the world in word and deed. He's calling you to be the example of what God can do in a life. He's called you to stand up and show them how God has saved you, how God has delivered you. Why go back to the old ways? Why go back? 
and settle for the times of bondage. So many Christians are going back to Egypt saying it was better for us to be in Egypt than to be out here and die. They're saying they don't want to die. They want to live their life. But the Bible says when you die, you live. And except if corn or wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But when it, when it dies, it abides much. It'll, it'll bring forth much fruit. So, are you ready to answer the call for such a time as this? Are you ready to stand and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Are you ready to be the voice that God needs in these last days to your family? Some families, when they get together, before the, they, the, the family comes over, they, they, they already have a, a prerequisite. Now, don't talk about Jesus. Now, don't get people aggravated. We need to tell them. I was on Facebook and I said, better to be confronted on, on Facebook than to be confronted at the great white throne judgment. Better that you're confronted here than confronted there because at least here you have an opportunity to change your mind. When you stand at the great white throne judgment, there is no other time to change. Your destiny is now sealed. So who do you know that needs Jesus? Who can you invite to church that needs Jesus? Pray that God would remove the barriers in their life that are hindering them from coming forward and accepting Jesus. I believe that God is about to do a massive revival. The revival that I believe he's going to do is Christians not walking through fire tunnels, not laughing and shaking and falling on the ground, but a revival of the fire of the, of the Holy Ghost and the uh, anointing to go out and share the gospel. We need that kind of revival in the last days. We need to be on fire with the sharing of the gospel to our nation. You know, we spend millions, if not billions of dollars on missions. We send money all over the world as Christians. And we neglect our own nation. There's not a greater nation in the world that's more blind than the United States of America. But it's time for the watchman to awaken. It's time for the watchman to awaken. It's time for the church to awaken and say, here I am, Lord. I will speak about you. Oh, God, send us that kind of revival. Lord, send us that kind of revival that will stir your people to get up out of those pews and get out there and tell people about you before it's too late. For the door of the Gentiles is about to close. And behold, now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. It's time for you to get on the phone 
And call your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your uncle, your cousins. And tell them, are you ready to meet God? Jesus loves you. Are you ready for such a time as this? Are you ready? For such a time as this. And you're never too old. Or you're never too young. Some of us can't go. Some of us can pray. If you got a strong body and you can go. Don't, per- don't just sit and pray. You can go. Don't let fear intimidate you. Because these are some of the things that will arise during this time. Intimidation, fear, spirit of manipulation will manipulate your feelings and emotions, will intimidate you. You can't do that. You, you, you don't, you, you, you're not qualified to do it. You can't go out there and you can't tell people about Jesus. You can't tell, you can't speak the truth. Because you know what? What will people think about you? They'll think you're a fanatic. They'll think that you're crazy. You know. Well, just tell them what David Diamond says. When they say, you're crazy, you say, at least I'm screwed to the right boat. Don't let the enemy intimidate you. The world's not intimidated when they come with their dirty jokes. The world's not intimidated to come and flash the sin of of this world in your face or their philosophies or their ideologies. Don't be intimidated. God has called you for such a time as this. Amen? Let's stand. Hallelujah. Can we pray tonight? Can we just pray? God, here I am. I'm not intimidated by the devil. I'm not intimidated by what he's going to try to do. But one thing I am sure of, that God, you have called each and every one of us for such a time as this. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, that there's a mighty move, a wave of your spirit God, and only those who have eyes to see and ears to hear in the spirit realm will know what you're doing. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us understanding of your Holy Spirit when he begins to move in the church. Father, with power and anointing. Father, you called us to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You called us to cast out devils. Hallelujah. Let's pray tonight. Come on. Let's pray for the barriers to be removed. God gave us that word in this church. To remove the barriers. He said, pray to remove the barriers. Begin to pray to remove the barriers in your son's and your daughter's life. In the name of Jesus. Begin to pray against the barriers of opposition when you share the gospel. Begin to to tear down the barriers that are, 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 are rised up against you with your loved one. With your with your unsaved spouse. God remove that barrier that's stopping them from advancing to your kingdom. Lord, remove the barriers, God, in my husband's life. Remove the barriers, Lord, that are in my wife's life. Remove the barriers that are in my children's life. Remove the barriers, God, that are in my uncles and aunties and cousins' lives. Remove those barriers that are keeping them for the fullness of you. Now, Lord, remove the barriers of hurt and discouragement in my life. Remove it, Lord. Lord, remove the barriers of inferiority. Remove the barriers, Lord, that 
of fear and anxiety and depression. Remove them, Lord, out of my life. Remove the barrier of rejection. Remove that barrier that has kept me from going forward. Remove that barrier of rejection. In the name of Jesus. Remove that barrier of fear. That I can't move here or move there or go here or go there. Remove that barrier of fear. Remove that barrier of compromise, God. In my heart and in my life. Lord, let me not compromise any longer for acceptance. Remove that barrier, God, of that thing that displeases you. Remove that barrier of addiction, God, that I have. Remove it, Father. And whatever the source or whatever the, the root of it is, God, remove that barrier, Father, so that I can be free and be free indeed. Hallelujah. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you will begin to move like never before upon your people, upon this church, upon this pulpit, upon the musicians, upon the singers, God. Upon the elders and deacons. And upon the youth, God. Let the youth begin to be caught on fire for you. Hallelujah. Take down the barriers, God. Of unbelief. Take down the barriers, God every single seat in this place being filled. Take down the barriers, God, of people being sent from this church around the world to serve you. For those who have a call, Lord, remove the barriers that have prevented their callings from coming forth, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Remove the barriers, God to our healings. Remove the barriers to our deliverances. Father, when people come through that church, uh, to, the, to our church doors, God, when they come into this place, Lord, let the barriers fall from their, from their lives. And let them feel, God, for the first time, no rejection, but love. God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your deliverance, God. Thank you, Lord. We're going to see the results. Thank you, God. You're going to move by your Spirit. You're going to tear down the walls. Lord, remove the barrier of half committedness to you. Remove that barrier, God. Remove that barrier, God, that prevents us from giving all to you. Remove that barrier. In Jesus' name. Lord, remove the barrier that prevents your Holy Spirit from moving in His fullness in this place. Remove the barrier of unbelief. Remove the barrier of those who will not enter in, God. Remove that barrier in their life. Lord, remove the barrier of lack of hunger. Remove the barrier, God, lack, that lack of thirst for you. In 
Is there anyone here tonight you feel like to pray to loose a barrier? Is anyone here you want to pray to loose a barrier I didn't mention tonight? I want you to come up and pray. I'm going to give you the mic. Come on. Somebody, you have something you want to loose. Come on up. Come on. Yeah, come on, sister. I just want to say it's time for the saints to come into agreement of fast. We see throughout the Bible where kings, not only kings, proclaim a fast, but men that went up against the battle of someone fighting against them, they always proclaim a fast. They seek the Lord and they proclaim a fast and God gave victory for them. It's time for the saints to fast. Because when we fast, we loosen the band of the wicked. The strongholds come down off of our lives, not only our life, but the life of our children. I was fasting for a while, off and on. But every now and again, then, God bring it to my attention that I need to fast. Because it was something my daughter was going through. And then that put me on a fast. And I just thank God for that. And I just thank God he let me know that if we fast, do people know that you get stronger when you fast? You, get, you have a stronger walk in God. The enemy won't come in and tear you up as it would do some of us. It, but we just got to stand and hold on to God's word. Thy gracious God, we ask you right now to come now, Lord. Speak to your people that we may go on one accord and fast for this church, for its glory, and for the pastor and his wife, and the sister pastor and his wife, and that we would do the things in him that this church may go forward, that it may go forth like never before, because your spirit is here, Lord. Manifest yourself tonight, Lord. Manifest yourself in your people, oh gracious God, and we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.